everybody it's goose it's wrestling pod uh, i'm here with andrew lee andrew lee how you doing bro i'm doing good that's a pretty cool looking iron chic shirt i never saw a shirt like that i got the iron chic shirt that's pretty uh, cool looking actually that's not like a old shirt it's like a newer shirt right oh yeah it's the same guys they made a few uh, they made the honky tonk man shirt i wore during Who's that Res- pro wrestling tees no uh nerds uh Russell nerds or whatever. They team with WWE for a little bit. They're not with them. They work for AEW now, but they don't make anything that's cool. So I like that coloring. You know, yeah. the green and stuff fading. And the fading words are cool. Too, it says Iron Sheet. Wow, the Mexican colors. I love it. I know, that. right? It is funny. <laughs> Guys, before we get into Russell War 89 and everything like that, uh, this weekend, this is dropping Friday, June 2nd, tonight. And tomorrow, me and Andrew Lee are going to be at the Church of Satire. There's discount tickets if you get them online. I want to put a link in the description this week for the show. Eight in o'clock. Hanover, Pennsylvania. Hanover, Pennsylvania. We got some other people on the show. I don't know. But the main thing is, the main attraction is me and Andrew Lee, bro. Why did we plug this last week? What? We did. Did we... I didn't do this intensive plug, I think. We did plug it. But then we oh. got right into seeing how CM Punk stuff is. But please, at church of satire, uh, dot com. Check, not a real church on Instagram. Check them out. Come see us. Come say what's up. Uh, I don't know if there's any listeners in the middle. Dude, of the- come out, hang out. We're gonna talk about. We'll talk about wrestling after the show. It'll be a lot of fun. Church of satire in Hanover, Pennsylvania, Friday and Saturday. Yeah, hold on. Let me put on mute because I got this guy behind me. So yeah, so come on out. It's gonna be fun. And I'll tell you what else was fun was Wrestle War '89. I yeah. thought this was the best NWA show we've watched so far. Um, no, uh, I thought. I was trying to think about the rundown from Chi Town, uh, the Chinatown show. What was that one? Chi Town Shuffle. Chi Town oh. Rumble. Chi Town. It was Chi Town. I thought it was Chi Town Heat. It's just Chi- they just take Rumble from WWE. They're always just biting off WWE when they have a better show than them. It is Chi Town Rumble. I thought it was Chi Town Heat. It should have been Chi Town Heat. That sounds better. Yeah, this show was better. Yeah, this yeah. show was better. Yeah, this was so far. But it's close. Chi Town Rumble wasn't the best show either. And, I, and I'm not talking about like future WCW shows, but so far from '83 to this, this is the best they've done so far. So this is what I read today, actually, that Dusty Rhodes was fired even before Shy Town Rumble. Yeah. Right? And her, Ted Turner had already bought. The, yeah, we're uh, technically in the WCW era, but they're still calling oh, okay. Yeah. And the one who's booking all this right now is Ric Flair. With Kevin Sullivan. And this is some good fucking booking, dude. Yeah. This is, uh, this you know. Is, this is good. This is, this is what. Actual finishes, pushing up young stars. Um, using the WWE guys who are, who Vince gave up on but are still stars to put over your guys. Yes. Um. Damn, Rick Flair's gonna get a bigger. The the guy who's athletic, which is great, Muda, is actually being showcased rather than the Blue Blazer. Like he's being he his match is short, but they showcase the shit out of him and they make you want to watch Japanese wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely, and. uh Sting, you know, pushing Sting and like you know, like Luger's still in the mix and everything. I I think Rick Rick Flair was um it was a hell of a booker. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, like I said, this is the era I I consider peak WCW more so than the NWO era because again, the NWO era was the problem with the NWO era is it's like the subtext of that was WWF is really better. Like the you know what I'm saying? Like WWF is here beating up these guys, you know. Yeah, this it a hot storyline. It is. I mean, no, dude. There's episodes of Nitro that Raw or a or Dynamite can't touch. But what I'm saying is, like, that's the subtext of the story. Like Hulk, all these WWF guys are better than our WCW guys, right? But here, it's like just like no, the WCW guys are the best. And when there is a WWF guy, they they're made to look like an idiot, you know. And talking about Iron Sheik. Yeah, Iron Sheik. Uh, not. Yeah, there was a couple of other ones, but uh, yeah, Iron Sheik obviously the most. But I think he was already his time yeah. was done. It, it, I, it's so funny because it feels like he's from a hundred years ago, even back then. Dude, yeah, he was only the champion like 
six years before this. Yeah, yeah, it, but he feels like a he feels like a relic. He yeah. seems like a relic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But no, this was a this was a pretty good show, and um, yeah, I think it, it's a, yeah, it's a pretty let's 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 start let's start from the top, and then if if anything relates to modern day wrestling, we'll talk about that too. So let's go. Yeah, we could do that. So Wrestle War nineteen eighty nine. The tagline is Music City Showdown. The reason why is because it's taking place in Nashville, Tennessee on May 7th, 1989. Supposedly the attendance is 5,200 people, which is rather small, but they were pretty hot for a small crowd. This is the same building where they have Ric Flair's last match last year. They also have um, a few Starcades here coming up, and they have some other, there was some other big event that took place here. A lot of WWE Raws and stuff take place here, even to this day. Uh, I see Nashville. Yeah, Nashville's a pretty well-known city. Well, a bunch of TNA shows have happened here too. So yeah, yeah, Nashville's well-known. Um, what what would you say Nashville and like the I guess most popular cities in America, probably in the top twenty? It's not in the top ten. Yeah, I heard it's becoming bigger and bigger. I mean, the comedy scene there is crazy. I would say, like in terms of comedy, I think in my mind it surpassed Boston. Um, I would say it's. I would say if you have to rate the cities based on comedy scenes, New York, L.A., Austin, and then Nashville, top four. So uh, yeah. not, not counting Chicago. I I would yeah I would put Austin above Chicago one hundred percent. Um, and I would put Nashville. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. So, yeah, Nashville's growing. I mean, it's already been big. It's always been big because of country music. It's always been big because of uh you know Taylor Swift comes from there. Elvis came mm-hmm. from there. So, you know, it's always been big. Yeah, so we get an introduction graphic, and it's got some country music playing, country rock, because Nashville, we get pictures of wrestlers mm-hmm. flying by, like Sting, Iron Sheet, and the Oak Ridge Boys, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> they just, yeah, so they, just... they, apparently, apparently, the reason why we like the show so much, there's a 20-minute concert from them in, in the original cut. that uh, uh-huh. 20... they cut that out. Yeah. 20-minute the... concert in the middle of the show. They were performing in the ring? No, on the stage. Oh, okay, yeah. They don't. You're not gonna see that in the Peacock version. No, that's why it's only two and a half hours. That whole other half hour is just the Oak Ridge Boys playing a concert. Dude, it's just so funny how like they're showing wrestlers, and then they show you the Oak Ridge Boys, but it's not even at the end. It's like in the middle of a swarm of wrestlers. So if they, you don't know any better, you just think they're like a wrestling stable. Right? They, they thought that the Oak Ridge Boys were a draw. They thought, yeah, yeah. They the thought they had bad body. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we get JR and Bob Cottle to welcome us. Uh, they throw it to Gary Capetta, the ring announcer, who's got with him Sailors and the Oak Ridge Boys. And the Oak Ridge Boys do sing the national anthem. Yes, Let me means- tell you something. So you do get an Oak Ridge Boys performance in the Peacock version. And I'll tell you something. They are no Rock and Robin. I would say that. You think they're worse? <laughs> No, no, they're way better. No, like, the Oak Ridge Boys are terrible. They, these guys can sing. They should induct the Oak Ridge Boys into the Hall of Fame. Why not? Yeah, they should. They should. Celebrity Hall of Fame. I, 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 w- I would put them in the Celebrity Wing Hall of Fame. I um, mean, they did more than Drew Carey. He's there. They did what? They did more than Drew Carey, and he's there. Yeah. Did they do any other WCW pay per views? No, um, not that I know of. Um, I don't think so, no. But yeah. oh, that's, that's all you need is one. Look at Kid Rock. Kid Rock's in the Hall of Fame. That guy did nothing. Wait, Kid Rock's in the WWE Hall of Fame? Yeah. That Hall of Fame is, like, such a joke. I know. That's, that's like why the Oakers boy should be there. Why not? Yeah, it's, like, the worst Hall. It's, like, we got Kid Rock in there, but Cindy Lauper's not in there. It's, like, the worst Hall of Fame ever. It's the worst. Ozzy Osbourne's in there, dude. He did, like, one Raw. Mm-hmm. They got, um... Yeah, I don't. I, it's not even. They got Tori Wilson yeah, in there. Fucking, debate, like, Tori doing... Wilson's in there. Jazz is not in there. It's fucking stupid. I, I don't consider that a real hall thing. Anyway, Jim Ross gives us an before the show begins. Jim Ross gives us an update on Gilbert and Kevin Sullivan, saying that the NWA board, uh, you know, they're like these guys. They they gotta take out their grievances later and like making it gotta feel like a real show. And he also does gives us a rundown of the full card, every single match, and. As he's going through all these matches, you, you, you see a lot of new faces and everything. And one of the matches announced is the Great Muda versus the Junkyard Dog. And then we go to our first match. It's the Great Muda, 
with Gary Hart with versus Doug Gilbert. <laughs> I was like, wait, where Doug, Doug where's Doug your dog? And then Jim Ross tells us that, oh, he just couldn't be here right now. Um, <laughs> he just said, he was like, yeah, JYD couldn't make it to the show. So here's some, here's Doug Gilbert to give some background. What happened? Why didn't JYD show up? You see how this match was laid out? Oh, yeah, yeah. Why do you think he didn't show up? Oh, because he was like, I'm not putting over this jab. Is that what he was thinking? He wanted to get squashed by the fucking great Muda. That guy ain't. Would you think if JYD showed up, he would have gotten squashed by Great Muda? Yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I don't think I would have showed up either then. Yeah. If you have if you have JYD go back and forth with Great Muda, first of all, you can't you can't showcase Great Muda's moves if JYD is doing offense, right? So he's gotta and if JYD is like hitting him with the fucking headbutt and shit, um, that makes Great Muda look like a fucking idiot. Yeah. So, like, you could tell they wanted Great Muda to be like they're almost pushing him like their version of Brock Lesnar. So you really think like they already know at this point, they know JYD can't really work anymore. Mm-hmm. But JYD is like, I'm not going to, I guarantee you JYD got the, heard like, you're going to put over a great mood of pretty strong. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to oversleep. Like, fuck that. I'm not going there. Yeah. That's a smart move by him. Anyway, great mood. Speaking of great mood, guys, he actually retired this year. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he, if you watch any of his retirement matches or his last match, uh, he did a retirement tour, basically. He looked terrible. Barely moved, but not here. He like the JYD totally different, yeah, totally different guy here. Uh, uh, by the way, while the match is happening, Eddie Gilbert shows up. He is the brother of Doug Gilbert. And Great Muda hits his moonsault for the win. This is the moonsault that is going to fuck him up for the rest of his life. And that's why he walks around all funny, because every time he was doing his moonsault, he was basically smashing his knees into the canvas, you know? That's why he walks terribly. But what did you think? Uh, I, Dude, I loved it. I loved seeing a, a perfect moonsault like that in 1989. I mean, we're not seeing that in WWF. No one's doing anything like that. It is a great-looking moonsault. It's it, a, is. it is a... 2023 moonsault um you know jim ross really thought they should have pushed him as one of the top guys for years and i agree with jim ross on that when i was a kid seeing him in the magazines he really like he caught my attention he caught my as a little kid and he was having i'm like oh i wish he was in wwf you know what i'm saying like and i think there was a lot of money and great mood long term but apparently this is what jim ross says there were people that worked at WCW that were still mad about Pearl Harbor and they didn't want to push him. I can believe that. Yeah, I can believe that. Dude, Gorilla Monsoon was using he Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Harbored him for like since the 90s, dude. I can believe I that. Know, the 80s. But uh, yeah, dude, I thought this was a great like start. It gets over this guy and lets you know he's the future and you're like, holy shit, like if this is the future, what are matches going to be like in a few yeah. years? Mm-hmm. There you go. So uh, we got Lance Russell. He's in the back with Ric Flair. And they're talking about a possible final chance. This is the final chance Ric Flair's going to get at this title. And he cuts a promo on Steamboat. And I thought it was a pretty good promo. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Ric Flair is good. He's good at the promo, man. Mm-hmm. We're going to go to match number two. Hacksaw, Butch Reed versus Ranger Ross who comes out with a bunch of sailors and Marines. I didn't know who this guy was, so I actually looked up Ranger Ross. Mm-hmm. Ranger Ross was an actual Ranger, like a yeah. you know, U.S. Army. Uh, he spent, get this, eight years in military service, and then he spent about eight years wrestling in total, right? And then he did about eight years in jail for robbery as, <laughs> as the motorcycle bandit, <laughs> the real thing. He was the motorcycle bandit. Um, he's doing much better now. He has since turned his life around. He works in ministry, he does charity, and he does occasionally still talk about wrestling and stuff like that. Yeah, but um, no one wants to talk to him about wrestling. Dude, I never hear anyone talk about this guy. I never I didn't know who this guy was. I had to look him up. I've never I, seen I've him. heard about him on, on the on the uh on the on the Conrad podcasts. I've never actually seen him. I really thought this guy was gonna be white. I didn't realize he was gonna be black. I thought he was gonna have like a Ranger Rick gimmick. Ranger Rick, that raccoon with the Boy Scout outfit. I thought it was going to be something like that. And then I was like, this is not what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Um, well, while this match is happening, Teddy Long 
who used to be a referee in the NWA, he comes out mm-hmm. and uh, they, the, the commentators give background on this. He say he was fired as a referee. I don't know why he's here. He's got a visitor's pass and he comes out with a pad and he's taking down notes. And basically uh, Butch Reed hits a flying shoulder block for uh, the win. Butch Reed wins. Butch Reed is a former WWE guy. Didn't turn out looking so bad here, though. I thought. Yeah, my only my only thing is if you're gonna give a guy, if you're gonna give a, a if you're gonna like create a character like this, he shouldn't be losing. Um, and if, yeah, and if you're yeah. gonna have him come out like that, if you're gonna have him lose, don't have him come out like that. Like he came out with like sailors and marines, like they did the whole thing. He this whole is why lot. I'm glad Junkyard Dog didn't show up because if they treated Great Muda like this, it would have been over for him day one. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's true. You can't bring in a new character, given this big family, and have him lose. It's a waste. Yeah. It's a waste of money. It's a waste. Why did you fly in all those people if you're gonna make this guy look like an idiot? But the match was okay. The match was okay. Butch Reed. I and I, look, I would put Butch Reed over this guy any day of the week. Yes, I would too. Butch Reed looks great. But if your plan is to hire all these extras and shit, then I, I would put over Ranger Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Lance Russell, he's in the back again. His time he's with Lex Luger, who cuts a promo on Michael Hayes. They're going to have a title match tonight. And Luger, he says that he's going to stay the U.S. champion. Then we're going to go to our match number three. This is a bull rope match. It's got Captain Redneck, Dick Murdoch, versus Bob Orton, who is with Gary Hart. Um, Murdoch, he uses his boots. Um... And he, uh, what do you call it? This is a weird, this is, this was a different bull rope match. Because when I was thinking bull rope match, I was thinking, like, get to touch the four corners. Remember that? You got to touch all four corners. This is not one of those type of bull rope matches. It's just like, you, you, they're both tied, connected to a bull rope, but you just got to pin or fucking submit the guy. So there's no buckle touching needed. Murdoch takes off his boot and he uses it on uh, Orin. Um, Dick Murdoch, basically, he hot ties Bob Orin. And then he drops two elbow drops on him for the win. What's really interesting is there's lots of bell shots. They take the cowbell and they hit him over the head. A lot of bell shots. Like they hit the boot. No blood at all. This is completely different from the previous NWA bull rope matches. Mm-hmm. And um, after the match, Gary Hart starts attacking Dick Murdoch. And then Bob Orton grabs the bull rope. And then he hangs Dick Murdoch from the ropes. Like he hangs him. This yeah. is a good time to uh, remind everybody that Dick Murdoch was a member of the KKK. So this was probably something that he was Face very his familiar face. with. The hanging. Um, yeah, this match was fine. I mean, you know, maybe if I cared more about these two guys, I don't. I don't like Dick Murdoch. I think Dick Murdoch's a waste of time, especially mm-hmm. knowing that he was in the KKK. Yes. Um, but it, it was it was fine. It wasn't wasn't too long. It was fine. Do you think when they were going over this with Bob Orton, he was like, that's not how you hang. Let me show you how to hang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get it wrong. Yeah. Almost I'm going to be in a if you don't know how to hang. Almost everybody confirms that he was a member of the KKK. He was. He was. Yeah. That's yeah. why I have, no, I have no time for him. I can't, like, it's like Benoit. Like, I can't do yeah, but with these people. Like, at a certain point, you're just a piece of shit. doesn't matter yeah. how, good are, how good your promos mm-hmm. are. Like at a certain point, like like, I don't care what I don't care about Hogan. What Hogan did, I don't care. I look. This is my thing. I care about how you are in the real world, how you treat other people. If you want to go home, if my boss treats me like gold, but then goes home and goes raise a fucking pile of shit, I don't care as long as I don't have to hear that. Right? That's his. Yeah, for sure. You won't even know. I won't even know. Right? But if someone records him like after he gave me raise after raise. Let me take time off. Then that fucking Ray. I think he's a useless piece of shit. Um, I don't think he's going to go anywhere in life. And they play that for me years later. Like, well, but he didn't treat me like that. So what do I care that he said that? My thing is, if you're a guy like Dick Murdoch and you actually go and join it, he had a fucking card. You go and join the KKK. You carry your membership card. Then I have no time for you. You're a piece yeah, of shit. Yeah, you show other people and shit like that. Here's yeah. the thing, too. I, when I was watching this guy, I don't know how he was popular. Yeah, he's not in good shape. He's got like a really shit. You know why? Because he appeals well, back to the in race. That, com- that company didn't matter about the not in good shape. Yeah, I guess he appeals to the racist audience in wrestling. Well, that, that, was, that was a they didn't that wasn't an out and out. It wasn't like everybody knew that. So I'm sure yeah, like the dirt, sheet, 
readers do it. But. Yeah, I guess the rednecks like them. He's Captain Redneck. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Lance Russell, he's with another redneck, Michael PSAs. He yeah. cuts a promo on Lex Luger and he says, he's doing it. Everyone remember, everybody knows me as a fabulous freebird and I always got these dudes around me. Not anymore. This is a singles match. There's going to be no, I ain't going to fucking have any tag team partners. I'm going to go out there as a single proof to him. I'm a single. Good promo by Michael Hayes, I thought. Michael Hayes could talk. This was a really good night for Michael Hayes. What? This was a really good night for Michael Hayes, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Dude, he he's not bad. Like, when his prime, like, he wasn't, like, terrible, I thought, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, we're going to go to match number four. Paul E. Dangerously. He's in the ring with the Usos. Uh, <laughs> Samu and Fatu, the Samoan SWAT team. This is actually, Fatu is actually the Uso dad. I was just like, and it looks, this looks, it looks fake almost because it's like, you got Paul Hammond, he's got his fucking cell phone, he's got that fucking Leia over, he's, he's wearing a Leia, the red Leia like he's wearing now. It's like, dude, this it, guy, it, he's still doing the same act. Dude, it's cr- I, I really do think Roman Reigns, the Usos, and Paul Heyman sat down and watched all of these old segments from WCW and said, we're going to do a direct sequel to it, and only the hardcore is going to pick up on it. I think so. I think you're yeah. right. I think, I think they did watch this, and they were like, we want to we wanna do that. Like, we just want to continue this thing. And it, it, it when you watch it now, it's just so fucking weird. Like, I, it felt very really weird watching it. I felt this like... This match felt more important... In 2023, than it than it had than it ever probably did. Yeah, yeah. Like this, it, feels like an, this feels like an important. Ma- I know it's not an important match, like, but it feels like a main event because it's like the only storyline is still going. You know, it would be like if you watched like, yeah, Avengers Endgame first, and mm-hmm. then you go back and you watch like the first Captain America, and you're just like, wait, 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 this part, this part. It's, that's that's what it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, they're facing the Samoan SWAT team of Samu and Fatu versus the dynamic dudes, which are Johnny Ace and Shane Douglas. And even seeing Johnny Ace would blow my fucking mind. Yeah, this this it's, feels like, yeah, this really does. It's a, such a strange, but here's the other thing too. It's actually a really good match. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Uh, basically, there there's just a move that I'm watching this and I was like, I want him to do them now. There was this one point where the Samoan SWAT team they actually kind of force Johnny Ace to do a leapfrog, yeah. and he like fucking jumps into a super kick because like he's bouncing off the rope and fucking Samu goes down. So when you somebody goes down, what do you do? You automatically jump over them. You leapfrog them, and as soon as he leapfrogs, he just like fucking ran into a fucking super kick. The crowd went like they were like, "Oh shit!" Like it looked devastating. It was great. Like moves like they should. This match had moves like that, and it was crazy. The Samoans, they do a majority of this match just beating the shit out of Johnny Ames, right? Beating on him the whole time. Paulie gets on the microphone in the, uh, near the ending that of the match. Crazy. He gets people upset. And that, but ref. however, what? He yells at the ref. You're an idiot. Yeah, he yells at the ref. He gets the crowd, gets all upset. But that causes, that leads right into the hot tag. And then uh, basically the finish happens when Fatu, he's got Shane up, right? Almost like he's going to body slam him. Johnny Ace goes up on top and hits a missile drop kick on Shane, who makes him fall on top of Fatu. And they go for the cover. It's a cover, and they count the pin, and uh, the dynamic dudes win. It's a huge upset. The crowd goes nuts because they know it's an upset. This was a good match. I like this was it. A really, really good match. Um, the Nothing dynamic- on the line. What? Nothing was on the line. No, no, no. I think it was just to get over the dynamic dudes because yeah. was, they wanted them to be their rockers. Um, it was a really good. They don't, they don't stay. They don't stay over. But this was the right move. again. This was the right move. But I have, I gotta say, like it's so crazy. Like so many. You think you think about like from that from then till now, and the fact that like ECW was a blip. Um, fucking uh, Brock Lesnar was a blip. But the but the the fucking Samoans and Paulie are still happening, and it just feel like all, so much of the aura feels like what they're doing in WWE, and it gave me a new appreciation of uh, Paul Heyman with the Samoan SWAT team. So, um, I think this is a match that gets better with age. And I heard, by the way, I heard apparently Rikishi is gonna become a regular character, starting on Friday. Are you serious? Yeah. 
Oh, I fucking love Rikishi. Which makes sense. Yeah, I love Rikishi, dude. I love Rikishi. Dude, um, yeah, that's fantastic. I, if they can get Samu too, and if he's like, if he can at least act, if he can act, he doesn't need to wrestle, but if he can act, they should bring in also Samu. So those of you guys are wondering, Samu is actually Roman Reigns' dad, right? No, 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 no. no. Samu is the, the other guy in this ring. Afa and Sika. Sika is Roman's dad. Sika is Roman's dad. Afa and Sika is Roman's dad? Sika is his dad. Oh, okay. Samu is, uh, I don't know who Samu, I, I think Samu is the son of wrestling. He does, Lance. Okay. Lance who is wrestling on MLW. But if they could get Samu also to show up on TV every now and then, I would do that too. Uh, why would you need Samu? If he can act, because it would add more. If he can act. If he can't act, then don't bring him. He's like, hey, let me bring my loser son back up from MLW. I'll only do it if you let my loser son come up. Oh, by the way, they oh. made uh, they made Samoan SWAT team figures, and they're really cool. I saw them at Target the other day. Oh, I saw the um, they're the head shrinkers. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah they, but they also the head the SWAT team in the back of Funny you say that because I just saw them recently as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the head shrinkers. Uh, uh, yeah, that's basically their the Samoan SWAT team with gold to be head shrinkers WWE. be. You know what's really interesting about. Oh, this is uh there is a Samoan stable in MLW right now as well. Wow. Like Jacob Fatu is with like I think Lance and uh Juicy. Uh to some big fat fucking Samoan guy. Like he's really fat. But anyway, I I love Polynesian wrestlers. I want more. I want like I want an entire company just filled with them. Well, th- this was a. Uh, I'm really I'm really surprised Vince let maybe like they were mad at Vince time. I'm surprised Vince let them go to WCW. Like, I'm surprised he didn't sign them right away, but, you know, whatever. Who, these, the Samoan Flock team? Yeah. Maybe Paul uh, Hayden. I don't know. Who knows? You know, you know what I think he, you know, I see that he, sometimes he does. Looks like maybe, do you think he maybe lets them go there first just to kind of see what they can do and then he fucking signs them up? I could see that, yeah. Yeah, like, so if you flounder in the NWA, I mean, there's no even fucking point even asking. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. But, anyway. Uh, we get Lance Russell. He's in the back. He's with the three judges for tonight's main event. It is Luthez. Uh, these are all former NWA champions. Luthez, Pat O'Connor. Uh, he's the one who, uh, I guess, innovated the the O'Connor room. And Terry Funk. And they, they give their inputs. And we're going to go to match number five, the U.S. title. It is... Michael P.S. Hayes comes down with uh, Hero Matsuda versus the champion Lex Luger. Teddy Long is back out once again, taking notes. Um, these guys are wrestling. It's probably the second longest match in this whole pay-per-view. The finish comes. It's not a bad match, but at the end, what ends up happening is like the worst ref bump I've ever seen. They totally <laughs> missed the ref. Yeah, the ref acts like he got hurt. He falls down. And then uh, both Michael Hayes and Lex Luger, they bump heads, and they're both groggy. Lex was down. Terry Gordy comes running in. He pushes Michael Hayes on top of Lex Luger. Lex puts his foot on the rope. Terry pushes it down. Lex puts his foot back on the rope. Terry pushes it down. Lex puts his foot on the rope, realizes Terry is leaving, so he takes his foot off the rope by himself. And then the ref counts a three for the win. I like this match until that fucking shitty ending that made me, like, hate this match. Well, yeah. Well, Terry Gordy doesn't last, or I don't know, but they, he doesn't come back with Freebirds. I I like this match a lot too. Um, the ending was stupid. I'm gonna blame Terry Gordy more than Lex because Lex has to be unconscious, and um, he can't see. And Terry, I think Terry mis mis hot timed. You know what I'm saying? What he was doing? Oh, because like, I think they worked out. I have to put my foot on the ropes a number a a, a certain number of times, and you'll knock it off. And I think, because Lex has to have his eyes closed, and he can't. He, he's looking at the rope. You know what I'm saying? So he has he just to, has to like, feel somebody taking his foot off the rope. Yeah. So right. when he put it back on, he, and the guy didn't take it off, he's like, "I gotta put my foot down." This is the finish. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm yeah. not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna blame Terry Gordy on that because this is also the time. Apparently, Terry Gordy is stops becoming a good worker. He starts having a lot of drug problems and stuff. So I'm yeah, gonna he... put that blame on Lex. Terry Gordy supposedly he had like uh 
he like died twice from yeah. doing drugs. Yeah. And then like the second time he was in like a coma and when he came back, he just was like kind of dumb and everything. But anyway, in Is this stuff when you have to like have your eyes closed and you're depending on the other person to do something. Mm-hmm. Because if you just oh. get up, if you look if you open your eyes, look around, then when you're supposed to lose, then the whole audience is gonna be like, especially if you're a baby face, looks stupid. Do you think Terry was like, God damn, why does he keep putting his goddamn foot on the rope? Maybe <laughs> like, like, I think it was a miscommunication how many times he's gonna put his foot on the rope. Yeah. Yeah, and he was like, yo, he keeps taking his foot off. That ref bump was horrendous too. You gotta admit, that was the worst of the ref bump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought again, this is another good match with with a flexi lexi. Yeah. All right, yeah. Lex Luger is great, man. He 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 makes some crazy bumps. Like he goes like flying over the top rope and just like laying on the fucking floor. Crazy. Dude, fucking wild shit. Yeah. Lance Russell, he's in the back with Sting, who gives a quick promo right before his match. And we're gonna go right into our sixth match. It is for the TV title. The Iron Sheik is already in the ring with Rip Morgan. And it's gonna be facing the champion, the, the TV champion, Sting. A bunch of random children start running away, running out. They're basically running away from an abusive sting, I'm thinking. Right? <laughs> and sting comes out, yeah. running after them. You can't get the kids. He goes into the ring. And the Iron Sheik starts using the flagpole on Sting, beating with the flagpole, choking on the towel. And she just looks terrible at this point. He's got like this giant Roy gut. And he's got like his arms are skinnier. So he looks like one of those like malnourished children from the third world. And um, everything, he, he beats on fucking Sting, and then Sting, like, just pops up, and he no-sells it, and then he hits the Stinger Splash, and then the Scorpion Deathlock for the win. This is, like, a two-minute match. Match sucked, but did what he needed to do. It basically said the Iron Sheik's old news, and Sting is the star tomorrow, and it's Sting's all Sting. over. You just, need, you just need to get Sting over. He was your guy. He he, sh- he already should have had the belt, in my mind, but uh, maybe I, I could, maybe he's still green. So just keep giving him wins. Good, good, good stuff. He was over, man. Sting was over. If only Tony Khan could book a trajectory like this, but he can't. You know what they? Sting wouldn't even be on this pay per view if it was up to Tony Khan. Do you think he should have been doing this with like Wardlow? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I think so they. They had, they had their mind that Sting was going to win the belt at the beginning of 1990. So all they do is give him wins. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what you do. Yeah, they probably should have done that with Wardlow, where they just kept having him beat just people on the roster. But you know what I think happens in um, AEW is like they do a lot of coke. He does a lot of coke, and he also does a lot of this. Like, I don't want to make this guy lose, dude. Um, it's like, dude, that's wrestling. People have to lose. People is- are gonna win, and people have to lose. You can't just like do this thing where I don't want this person to lose, and so forth. But do you and get that you know, feeling? Yeah, and I'm sure like there'd probably be an argument like, oh, Iron Sheik was sober in WWE. But it's like, no, his time was up. And the best thing to do is to use him to make the best thing, the best use of the money you're giving him is to make Sting look like a champion. You know? Yeah, because he's already a name. Might as well use it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, and it's like you you could have, you know, you could have had like you could, I mean, I don't think Iron Sheik physically could do it anymore, but you could have had them go back and forth for like 20 fucking minutes. But then Sting, it, that does Sting no favors. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't do anybody favors, exactly. Too many favors, yeah. All right, Lance Russell, he is in the back with Ricky Steamboat, who cuts a promo on being champion, and that this is Ric Flair's last chance. After this, he ain't going to get any more because there's plenty of people on this roster who deserve a shot. That was good. We're going to go right into match number seven. This is the main event, but it's not really the last match. And the reason yeah. why is supposedly there is a... Um, the reason that they give Kevin Sullivan give is that he wanted to have the other two matches going on so they could get updates about Ric Flair to let people know that Ric Flair was injured. I think it was fucking stupid. I thought the show was great. I uh, it should have ended with this match and the, and the angle that proceeds that that goes after it. But uh, oh. I think having those two dopey matches after the main event, I didn't care about those two matches. I read that they did it because they wanted to. Let fans know, like, this is a, a one hour limit, but there's like, it, you know, if you leave it, if there's three hours in the pay per view and then it goes to like it, the match starts at the second beginning of the third hour, oh, you know, it's going to go. No, I, I know, but like, they, they said the reason that Kevin Sullivan game, gave on his podcast was so that they could 
give updates about Ric Flair throughout the rest of the show. Oh, well, that's stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, and then let the right. fans know Ric Flair's not coming back for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go to match number seven, our main event. It is for the NWA world title. It is Flair comes out with about 40 women that he has harassed. And, <laughs> and he's going to be facing Steamboat. And like these women, they're like, I'm like, I was like, when I watched this, I'm like, Steamboat, dude, Flair is out here with women with fucking pokey, right? Mm-hmm. Like you better, like, please don't come out with your fucking lame ass family. Like, please don't do this with your lame ass loser family. And then this fucking like curtain or snake comes up and it's his goddamn family. <laughs> it's his baby on a fucking pony. And I, I think it is his wife who's just like Colonel Sanders. Oh, and I was like, the way. You could tell it's all her idea, bro. I was like, get the title. I saw this, I was like, get the title off this loser. That's all I thought. And you know what? Here's the thing. That woman who's just like Colonel Sanders isn't even his wife. His wife is standing behind her. But like when the current comes up and the first thing you see is Rick, uh, Ricky Steamboat, a baby on a donkey, and a fucking woman dressed like Colonel Sanders, you just think that's a family and you're just like, you hate this family. It's so but then, but then the wife, I don't know if you know, the wife runs ahead, so she's like in the shop. Yeah, yeah. She tries, she pushes the head to get the ring. She's like fucking, she thinks she's Vanna White. Dude, like it's so funny how like, I think part of the appeal of Ric Flair versus Ricky Steamboat is that they're, they're like, opposites, right? Yes. And but you can do that without having her walk to the ring with that kid on a horse. Yeah, like, they're going, he's coming out with 40 women, here's a family man. But here's the thing. Both these fucking guys have divorced four times. Yeah. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, they're What I'm saying is, like, like what you could have done is a video package where you show, like, pictures of Rick, Ricky Steamboat, like, at Christmas. Like, a Christmas yeah. photo. And then show Ric Flair in a, in a limo. You don't need to have the baby and the wife come to him to the ring. Yeah. And you know, we were, we were watching all these other people and we're talking about how Rick, uh, Ricky Steamboat should have been the guy. I 100% now change my mind. He should have been the guy. Well, no, he, no. This, this is the bullshit that would have came with it. This woman ruined his career. And I don't care what anyone says. She made a lot of bad decisions on his behalf that stopped him from becoming the guy. And she she tells him to eventually leave. He he only has one more pay-per-view, and then he leaves WCW for a few years and goes back to Vince and then leaves Vince. She kept giving him bad advice. You know, it's so funny. Back in the day, I remember, like, a weird woman would like me, right? This is back in the Caroline's days. And I would be like, oh, I don't want to – I don't like her. And somebody would say to me, well, you don't have – why not? You don't, have any, you don't have anyone else going – nothing else going on. Why not her? And this is why not her. Because if I – I would rather be alone – then have a woman like this ruin my career. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can't pick Ricky Steamboat without her. That's just part of the package. It's like going, I'll take Junkyard Dog without the drug problem he develops. No. That's well, part they, of they tried to make her part of the package for this one year. No. And they don't do it again. Like, when he goes back as the dragon, she's not around. Thank it was, God. It was a huge mistake. It was really stupid. Yes. It's a huge mistake. It's really dumb. He looks stupid with it. Um. Anyways. Uh, they introduced the three judges, and during the match, what's going to happen is the judges are actually – there's rounds happening where the judges are taking their vote, but the match isn't stopping. It's just like somebody's collecting their vote. Okay, so what happened was the last match went to a draw, and what they're doing is they're there. If there is a draw, again, there must be a winner. The judges will pick the winner. Yeah, so they're, the judges are actually doing something while this match is happening. They're actually still voting during yeah. rounds. Uh, during this match, Steamboat takes about like four dives over the top row. Like he takes four. It's crazy. There's two flare flops. Their styles are very different. And I really think that's what really makes this work. You know, like they're Ricky Steamboat is constantly going up to the top, constantly going up to the top. Um, Flair is more like, you know, it's grimier, you know, but they're both pretty good. Uh, the last, what happens up happening is, Ricky Steamboat, he goes up to the top turnbuckle one too many times. The last time he goes up, Ric Flair fucking kind of lands on the ropes, shaking the ropes. Then Rick, uh, Steamboat falls down out of the ring, and he hurts his knee. He comes back in the ring. He's never the same again. And uh, he has his weak knee now. He picks up Ric Flair for a body slam, and he kind of stumbles a bit, and Ric Flair is able to reverse it for the cover and the win. 
after uh, Ric Flair wins, there's fireworks, and Ricky Steamboat shakes his hand, raises his hand, and leaves. And then, uh, want me to stop right there? Or you want me yeah, to let's stop with the matches and get into the angle, because I feel like the okay. angle. So uh, afterward, Jim Ross comes in. Wait, wait, wait let's talk about the match. Oh, yeah, yeah, talk about the match. Sorry. Uh, I thought, again, I thought it was a fantastic match. I'm watching this match, and I'm realizing that at that time, in 1989, there was no one better than Ric Flair at that time. Yes. Yeah. 1989, he could talk, he could wrestle, yeah. You know what? Everything that he says is proven the last two pay-per-views. Everything he says about himself is proven. Um, it was a perfect showcase for these two guys. And, yeah, I, the hype is real. If you people tell you how great these matches are, definitely watch them because they are. Dude, they said 15 minutes went by. It felt to me like two minutes. That's how yeah. good this match is. You know what it is? They, they're both like... They, 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 and they don't stop. They don't stop. Yeah, but you know what they selling. say? And yeah, they, they talk about... If you watch those like old Ric Flair documentaries and stuff, he talks about his his rivalry with uh, Steamboat. He says something like, we never discussed a single thing. Yeah, And you can see it in this match. In the, in the sense that I think the best form of wrestling is like pure improv, right? Like whatever somebody does, just go along with it. There's such a flow to, to their yeah. match. There's this thing where Ric Flair, he does this thing where he, when he gets run into the corner, he kind of turns upside down, right? And he usually, like, he turns all the way upside down and he runs on the apron. The first time he does it, he kind of doesn't go all the way over and he comes back down. And as he's coming back down to stay face, Ric Flair kind of tangles himself onto it, almost like in a tree of woe. Yeah. And Ric Ricky Steamboat just fucking he first you see him like look at it like what the fuck am I supposed to do? But then he just goes with it and just goes boom, starts attacking him. There's another time where Ric Flair does a, the second time he goes, flips over the top turnbook and he runs across the apron. Steamboat just gives him a chop and fucking Flair does this incredible bump on the apron. But like all these things that you normally never see in like regular Ric Flair matches, like any little thing they just improvise it, it just looks great. Yeah. Fantastic. And what makes this match and this show even better is the angle that happens next. So why don't we talk about that? Yeah. So after the match, Jim Ross is uh, interviewing Ric Flair. And Terry Funk, one of the judges, comes in to say, I want to be personally congratulate him. And they go, oh, thanks, Terry Funk. Thank you. And then he goes, Terry Funk's kind of lingering around. And then he's butting in. He goes, hey, you know what else? Uh, I, I would like to challenge him for the title. And Ric Flair says, oh, bro, you've been in Hollywood. And... You know, you're making movies and stuff, and Terry Funk's like, yeah, so what? And he's like, well, dude, no offense, Terry, but you're in Hollywood making movies with Sylvester Stallone. I, I'm i taking challenges in the top ten. And, you know, no offense, you've been, like, retired now, like, two years because you're making movies. You're not in the top ten, dude. And the way he, Ric Flair is saying it, he's trying to stay in it in a professional way, but it's it's slightly insulting. Slightly. And Terry it's Funk... Like, kind of like we, we do things, we have a top ten. Yeah, yeah, it's He's trying to be professional, but he's also saying, like, dude, you're not in the top ten for wrestlers. And this is a former champion. Yeah, and Terry, you can see Terry Funk getting a little annoyed, like a little like, wait, wait, what do you mean I'm not in the top ten? And then at the end, he just goes, like, all right, dude, dude, I'm so sorry. And then he goes, well, he'll shake my hand. And then he just starts beating the shit out of Ric Flair, throws him outside. He power drives him to the table, throws tables and chairs on him. Pretty good. I remember seeing this. This was good. Uh, I thought this was a great angle. It's a great way. Because you're not, you're not thinking of Terry Funk the entire show. You just think he's there, like as as a judge. Yes. When he's in the ring, you think like, oh, this is over. We're gonna keep moving on with the show. And then when he just beats, and they didn't do table spots back then. Though. No, they did not. Dude, the fact that he puts him through the table, he doesn't put him through the table, which makes it hurt even more. He becomes, he goes from I'm not thinking about this guy to the number one heel in the company. Yes. Like, it's so fucking well done. And it's such a fucking... You know, I was thinking AEW should repeat this angle, but with Big Show and MJF. Oh. That would be pretty cool. I would love to do that. No one would think... But have Big Show really destroy him? Yeah. Because no one would think that Big Show would... would, You know, they're going to go that way. But if you you can get if you can get the audience to really hate Big Show, I because like oh we've already counted him out like you know kind of like Terry Funk like he's the past who is Rick Flair gonna and all of a sudden it's like Big Show is now the top heel I don't think people would see it coming. 
they should start having Big Show interview winners of a match starting now. And so yeah. that, but that, when it happens, it doesn't look weird. Why is Big Show there? You know, yeah, it's they, just like, they, oh, like, like MJF like wins his group. Let's say it's like against Adam Cole at the next pay per view. He wins this grueling match, and everyone thinks like, he's gonna fight CM Punk next. You, then- you know, like when they did the fucking um, Don Callis the first time. Don yeah. Callis, he was joining them on commentary for a couple of times before he fucking helped Kenny Omega, and then they ran to Impact Wrestling. Yeah. Remember that? And yeah. it, it was it wasn't out of place because he was on commentary a bunch of times before it actually the real shit went down. Uh, so they should do it like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this was on the the first. Ric Flair DVD collection. That's yeah, they, they, they show it a lot. This, yeah, and um, it's it's a great angle. It was a really like, yes. you're not expecting an angle like that to happen. On they don't really do angle at this point. They don't do angles on pay per views. They don't. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and this is also, if you're a fan, that's just starting watching, a new angle. Starting a new angle. Yeah. yeah. If you're a fan who watches TV and and because remember we didn't have the internet back then, you put on like the Saturday show and they're like Ric Flair is he won but he's like in the hospital. Because of Terry Funk, you're gonna be like, "Fuck, I gotta order these pay per views." Yeah. Like, what do you mean, Ric Flair's in the Ric Flair won, but he's in the hospital? You know that you stop fucking your cousin when you hear that in Alabama. <laughs> well, you finished, but then you know, I, I was finished. Yeah. We gotta get you. We, we gotta order the next pay per view. You know. Yeah. All right. So uh, that was the main event, but it uh, the, there's still about 30 more minutes left in this pay per view. Uh, Joe Pettisino, uh, he is with Nikolai Koloff, who's uh, dressed up like a referee, and he's going to be a Nikita referee in this Koloff. match. Nikita Koloff, sorry. And Nikita Koloff does a promo with the worst oh, Russian God. accent. I This is such a bad Russian accent. And I'm like, you've been doing this Russian accent for like at least four years now, I think. Mm-hmm. Can't you like improve it? But no, he doesn't. We're gonna go to our match number eight. It's for the world tag team titles, the varsity club of Mike Rotunda and Dr. Death Steve Williams champions versus they were they're in the ring with a bunch of cheerleaders and Kevin Sullivan, who is the coach slash games master. Ugh. <laughs> versus the Road Warriors with Paul Ellerin. Uh Koloff, uh, he throws fucking Sullivan out uh mid in the beginning of the match. Uh, basically what that happens is the Legion of Doom, not Legion of Doom, uh, the Road Warriors, they put fucking Steve Williams up on a Doomsday device and they hit it, but after they hit it, Dan Spivey and Kevin Zillum, they come out and they fucking pull out, uh, Nikita Koloff and they start beating him up. They're beating up a referee. So basically it's a DQ and the War Road Warriors win by a DQ. What did you think? I just, I really couldn't get into it. Um, I was so like kind of spent about uh the Ric Flair, Terry Funk, Ricky Steamboat uh saga that this to me it's like it's like if they did it Night of Champions after the Roman angle, then they put Rhea Ripley and Natalia. It's like what do I do? I was spent too, but the crowd they did get into this fucking they did, but I mean I, I it was okay. I just I couldn't get into it. And uh I don't know. I, I don't know either. I couldn't either. I don't know how these fucking people did in the in the I think they just were so excited to see the Road Warriors, but like I already know they they're booking the Road Warriors like shit, and this was another example of that. And maybe they're yeah. they going to keep Koloff's back because remember he was still popular with these retards. But I don't yeah. know. I, I just was like, it was like putting the the two most inconsequential matches last. I mean, it was like ridiculous. Every other match felt like it had stakes, but this. Yeah, and I think yeah. like the titles, right? These weren't like. They're, yeah, they're both for the both for they they had two sets of tag yeah, titles. Somehow the Samoa SWAT team match feels more important. Yes, and there was no tag titles in that one. So this that last match we just talked about had the world tag titles. The final match, match number nine, is for the U.S. tag titles. Just it weird. is oh yeah, it is hot stuff. Eddie Gilbert and Rick Steiner, the champions, with Missy Hyatt versus Kevin Sullivan and Dan Spivey. Some more fucking. Varsity Club shit. Uh, Rick Steiner, he basically clotheslines Kevin Sullivan, and then uh, Doug Gilbert, Jackknife covers him for a win. Uh, afterwards, Dan Spivey starts beating up Rick Steiner with a chair. Mm-hmm. And then after this match, uh, JR, he's basically talking about how the Varsity Club have been stripped of their tag titles because of uh, what happened when they attacked uh, Nikita Koloff and 
they kind of recap that Re- Ric Flair, he's in the hospital and shit, and that's how the show ends. What do you think about this final match, dude? Again, like, I think, you know what? I think the audience was into it, but I'll tell you this. So let's say, like, we're watching, let's say the next pay-per-view is Roman Reigns versus Jimmy Uso, right? Yeah. Let's say that's the next pay-per-view. And we only have two matches left. It's Roman Reigns versus Jimmy Uso, and then the last match is Zelina Vega versus uh, Piper Niven. But somehow they do Roman Reigns and Jimmy Uso first. In my mind, I'm thinking they're going to do a massive angle. Something insane is going to happen at the Zelina Vega match. That's why it's going last, right? Yeah, you would think that. Or something yeah. is going to happen right afterwards. It's yeah. going to happen. Like, why would they have... So then if Piper Nevin and, and Zelina Vega go out and just have a regular match, and that's the final match, you're like, why did that go... Like, But I'm going to be invested because I'm like, they must have something insane planned. Maybe like... You know, Britt Baker's going to come. Like, something insane must happen. And I think that's what people thought. Like, if that was the middle of the show, something's going to happen with the Road Warriors. That's crazy, right? They're going to do something. And we know nothing happens. We know because of history. Wait, did, the, did the Oak Ridge Boys perform after this? No, that was before. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe that's what they're, they're yeah. like, we believe in the <laughs> oh, like, 20 minutes. Oh, I know already, like, nothing's going to happen. Like, maybe in their minds, because they don't know. Maybe, oh, maybe Randy Savage is going to run out. Maybe fucking Jake is... They don't know, because they don't know. You know, they're not smart. Wait, they don't have the fucking Twitter. So maybe that's why they were still into the show. But I already know, like, Terry Funk is the real... The real the real finish of the show is Terry Funk, Paul Drogon, Rick's plan. Show essentially over after that. So again... I would it's- say, even though it's like a whole hum ending... All in all, it's actually a pretty fun, easy it's to watch. A, it's a great no, no, it's a great show. Yeah, even with the two matches, I just feel like it was a disservice. Well, you know, you know what I also think. I think Kevin Sullivan wanted to say he may have entered a pay per view because he was the co booker. So I think that's why that match goes last, so he could be like in the middle. Oh, I could totally see that. Yeah, I could totally. See well, that. no, no, you. We need to. We need to have Jim Ross talk about how injured you are. So my two matches should go last. You know. That Kevin Sullivan wanted to be like I made him because I'm because back then not, not a lot of people have made event pay per views like mainly just Hogan and Ric Flair. So the fact that Kevin Sullivan got to main event one, he can be like, eh, you know, fucking Ultimate Warrior didn't main event a, a, a pay per view yet. <laughs> yeah, event I can event. totally see that these egos on these guys. I can totally see that happening. Yeah, so man, that's it. But no, you're right. I thought this was a great show. It did not feel like two and a half hours. <laughs> um, you know, if the NWA was started like this back in like 1983 they would be in a whole different fucking yeah. ball game. i been. think you know people are saying that like with the cody <laughs> roasting they're trying to copy dusty's booking why would you try to copy dusty's booking wow. like this is the booking this company needed the dust yeah. and um yeah i thought this was this so far 89 so far 1989 they blow away wwe and and, yeah. and it almost feels like addition by subtraction. What I mean by that is without without Arn and Tully, there's no more Four Horsemen. Without Dusty Rhodes, there's no shitty booking. Without J.J. Dillon. So like without those parts, you have to bring up new parts and the new parts are really fucking working. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like you you can totally see there's a noticeable difference once Dusty's gone. There's a yeah. noticeable difference. And that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing, actually. For Dusty. That's a bad thing for Dusty because it shows how shitty he was. But even like, I feel like they don't. Throw, they can't do the four horsemen shit anymore. So now Ric Flair, ha- they have to bring in Terry Funk. They have to bring in Ricky Steamboat, and he's having these. And then you have to bring in this guy from the Orient, um, Great Muda. You have to bring in this guy. So like, and then you have to bring up Sting. So like, all it, it was sitting in 1998 WWF. If you think about it, the, the the roster from a pure work rate standpoint in like March of 1998 is fucking atrocious, right? Yeah. Compared to WCW and even ECWs. But because they couldn't rely on Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, or Rey Mysterio, Dean Malenko, they had to get creative, and that's why the show became must see TV because they have to get creative. And the same thing happening in WCW in 1989, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> always uh, that's always good when you have to really you can't rest on your laurels. You yeah, know? it always brings out the best in people. And I would say that to Tony Khan, addition by subtraction. And what I mean by that is if you don't have fucking Chris Jericho that has to. If 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 you don't have Chris Jericho taking up twenty minutes of TV time every week, what else could you do? Who else? He's got a bloated roster. He's got a bloated roster right now. Yeah. Cut it, cut it out. Yeah. I think the best thing to happen to that company was 
the four horsemen leaving and Dusty leaving. Because look how much better the show is. Yeah. And Ronnie Garvin. Ronnie Garvin too is in W is in WWE. Yeah. Yeah. Ronnie Garvin. Yeah. All right, guys. That's the Russell War. Thumbs up. Go check it out on the Peacock. You'll enjoy it. Next week, Andrew Lee, we're still in NWA WCW, Great American Bash 89. The main event, the three big matches, ready three big matches? Ric Flair yeah. versus Terry Funk, Ricky Steamboat versus Lex Luger, and Sting versus Great Muda. Come on. Wow, that's pretty good. Those are three. Those, those, those are three main events. Two weeks after that, we have SummerSlam 89, Zeus and Savage versus Beefcake and Hogan. Also Warrior Rude rematch. And then the Brain Busters versus Heart Foundation. Then in three weeks, Halloween Havoc 89, where Flying Brian takes on Lex Luger and Sting and Ric Flair take on Great Muda and Terry Funk. And then in four weeks, Survivor Series 89, where we got Team Hogan versus Team DiBiase. Looking Pretty forward to this. This doesn't look bad. It's like yeah. the Good American Bash 1989. It's going to be two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah, and I think, like, I heard it's supposedly, like, from a work rate standpoint, a really good show. So we're going to check that out next week. We're still in NWA. But where you're going to be this weekend is in Hanover, PA, at the Church of Satire, to check out me and Andrew Lee. Follow us. Subscribe to the podcast. Come see us do stand-up. Follow me on Instagram, Ray Goots, Com Ray Goots on Instagram and Twitter. And then on TikTok, Ray Goots Comedy. Give us a follow. Come to the show. And watch Great American Bash 89. And we'll be back next week to talk about that. And why Tony Khan is a piece of shit. Thank yeah. you so much. We'll talk Bye. to you.